All right, the last part of this lecture is actually covering 8.1 and 8.2. And we are covering it because I think it ties in nicely to this chapter. Um, so defects in mitosis and meiosis are important for understanding human health. And so you've actually learned enough about these processes to actually understand um, a lot about one of the um, some of the things that affect um, uh, human disorders. Um, and then also um, for miscarriages. So this occurs because of something called chromosome non-disjunction, and that occurs when either homologous chromosomes or sister chromatids fail to separate um, during either anaphase, anaphase one, or anaphase two. And so it results in gametes that carry an improper number of chromosomes. So it's responsible for a large number of genetic disorders, um, diseases caused by abnormalities in the genome. Um, and unlike other genetic disorders, these are largely spontaneous in nature, and then they rarely end up being inherited, and they can be recognized by karyotypes in the affected individual. Um, so an example of chromosome non-disjunction is that we have a organism right here, and so this um, individual has three chromosomes that are depicted. And so you see two of these chromosomes properly separate the sister chromatids um, into, into the cell. So this is probably an example of meiosis two. And so the reason we know it is uh, meiosis two is because we do not see the tetrads. Um, so the homologous chromosomes would be separating if this was meiosis one. Um, oh, sorry, I guess I put mitosis, but it really should be meiosis because they're an improper, they're an odd number of um, chromosomes within the cell. So, so this um, diploid individual with a diploid number of six um, has three unique chromosomes, chromosome one, chromosome two, and chromosome three. And what you can see is that chromosome one and chromosome two have properly segregated the sister chromatids into the distinct cells. Um, but if non-disjunction occurs, then this protein bridge that holds these sister chromatids together never actually separates, and so you end up pulling both chromatids to one side, and then one of the cells actually doesn't have any chromosome three. Um, so if non-disjunction occurs during anaphase one, um, you can see it depicted here. What has happened is that these this tetrad kind of, of um, homologous chromosomes um, has both separated to the same cell. And so you have your two cells, and now you'll notice that they have an improper number of chromosomes within them. This one has three, this one has five. And so then when you do the, um, the uh, next round of meiosis um, and to create the four different gametes, what you end up having is two cells with five chromosomes and two cells with three chromosomes. And so this is referred to as a trisomy one, whereas this is referred to as a monosomy one. Um, and so this is a gamete, and if we form, if we have a fertilization with a second gamete that has the proper number of chromosomes, you end up having what having, so this has two chromosome ones. So this right here is chromosome one. So these have, these two cells have two chromosome ones and one of all of them. And then these cells have zero chromosome ones um, and one of the remaining ones. Uh, so what you end up having is three copies of chromosome one because you received a, uh, chromosome one from the second gamete. And so that's why it's called trisomy one is because you have three copies of trisomy one. If this gamete ended up fertilizing um, an egg with a normal number of gametes, then you would only have one copy of chromosome one from the mother um, because there is no copy of chromosome one in this gamete. And so this is called a monosomy one um, to indicate that there's only one copy of chromosome one. And so this, 
number indicate which chromosome has the improper number of chromosomes. Um, you can again do non-disjunction during anaphase um, two. Um, so in this cell right here, we've had a non-disjunction event in chromosome one. And so you would form normal gametes um, from this, this because you did not have a non-disjunction occur. Um, but these two would have an improper number of gametes. One would have one chromosome one too many and one would not have a chromosome one. So again, if you did fertilization, you would end up with a, with a fertilized egg that has three copies of chromosome one, trisomy one, um, or one copy of chromosome one, monosomy one. So I'd said before that this can actually lead to um, genetic disorders. And so one of the most famous genetic, genetic disorders that is caused by a trisomy is Down syndrome. So Down syndrome is a disease caused by trisomy 21. Um, so this is characterized by intellectual and physical disabilities, uh, poor immune function, and then increased risk for other health problems. And so if we did a karyotype of an individual with Down syndrome, you know, this is you know, one of the reasons why the genetic basis of this syndrome was recognized so early on is that you can actually determine it just by using a karyotype, um, which has been around for, you know, actually I'm not sure when it was developed, um, but almost probably a hundred years. Uh, so if we looked at the karyotype, we would notice that chromosome 21, there was actually three copies um, of this chromosome. And so from the karyotype, you can actually recognize this is a tris trisomy 21. And so these individuals that had the same syndrome when they did the karyotypes, they, they identified that these, many of these individuals ended up carrying trisomy 21. There's actually a few other um, uh, genetic reasons that you can have Down syndrome um, that are not trisomy 21s. Um, those are covered further in chapter eight, but um, I will not be covering them in class. So, there are certain diseases that have been identified that are associated with various trisomies. Um, so trisomy 21, we just talked about as Down syndrome. If you had a trisomy of the 18th chromosome, this would result in a, in a syndrome called Edwards syndrome. Trisomy 13, Patau. Trisomy 9 and trisomy 8 um, are kind, are set, you know, they're, they're all very, these are very rare, um, but individuals have, uh, have these syndromes and, you know, the genetic basis of these have been kind of determined. Um, you can also have trisomies of the um, sex chromosomes. So if you had a trisomy of the, uh, so if you had triple X chromosome, so if there was a non-disjunction so that two X's um, uh, uh, were segregated to an individual gamete, um, if this individual, uh, if, the, if this gamete paired with an X gamete, you would have an individual with triple X syndrome. Um, and then if you had a trisomy that uh, uh, paired with a Y gamete, you, these individuals have what's called Klinefelter syndrome. Um, and then if you had a Y, a disjunction that resulted in two Ys, um, if they paired with an X chromosome, um, they have what's called XYY. And then you can also have a monosomy, um, which results in an individual that just has an X chromosome, and then that is Turner syndrome. Um, so these, in general, uh, syndromes are much more mild, um, and that's because your body actually, um, uh, there are processes that occur on the, um, sex, on the X chromosome in order to, to um, control dosage. dosage. Um, differences and these seem to help ameliorate um, some of the genetic defects that might have occurred otherwise. Um, so you can imagine there's a large number of other trisomies that, that, that should exist, trisomy one, two, three, four. You notice that the only monosomy that is listed here is on the X chromosome, and you might what hap wonder what happened to those individuals. Um, and what happens is that most trisomies or monosomies, actually something goes wrong during development um, to the point where 
um, something either goes wrong with gamete development where the gametes don't form properly or something goes wrong during after fertilization um, where something goes wrong in development and that results in a miscarriage. And so most trisomies or monosomies actually result in a miscarriage um, and the, you know, the individual is never born. Um, most individuals with these disorders do not reproduce, um, but if they did reproduce, then they would be at risk for passing on this syndrome um, to their offspring. So one of the things that you potentially could encounter, which is certainly something that my generation has encountered, is the risk of trisomy increases with the age of the mother. Um, so we are having babies later on and later on in life and you know my wife and i didn't have kids until we were in our 30s and so one of the things that happened during during prenatal care was that you had visits in order to um, determine whether or not your your child your fetus has um, any sort of um, genetic diseases such as down syndrome and part of the reason for that is your risk for having a child with Down syndrome goes, goes up with the maternal age. Um, so early on in life, if you have a child very early on, you have a very low probability, 0.1%. Um, but you know, if you have a child in your 40s, you know, that risk raises up to 3.6%, you know, which is a pretty substantial risk. Um, miscarriages. I never knew anything about miscarriages until you know me and my friends started having babies, but they're much more common um, than you might have realized. So 10% of all miscarriages, um, sorry, 10% of, <coughs> of all fertilizations end in miscarriage. And so, um, you know, this is in very young mothers and then this rate goes up you know to the point of 30 40 almost 50 percent um, depending on the age of the mother and so if you look at what changes during the um so if 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 you look at the karyotype of the fetuses that miscarriage you see that the percent that have kind of normal karyotypes remains the same um, but what really changes is the number of uh, individuals that have a trisomy that can be recognized by a karyotype. And so what that says is that, is that as the age of the mother increases, the likelihood of non-disjunction actually goes up. Um, and so this is thought to be in, caused by the age of the oocyte. Um, so if you look at oogenesis, how it occurs, um, so the mothers, all of, all of the female's primary oocytes are actually created very early on during development. So um, this occurs during the third trimester of pregnancy. And the, we reach the point where the primary oocyte is created and then this, these cells pause. So the mother is born with a set, you know, at birth, the female is born with a set amount of these primary oocytes. And then once ovulation occurs, um, you know, between 13 and 15 years of the mother life, a single one of these oocytes is released. And then by releasing it, it allows this oocyte to go into meiosis one and meiosis two. So it's not until, you know, the, the female is 13, 14, 15, 20, 30 years old um, that this oocyte actually undergoes meiosis and meiosis too. So for some reason that's not very well understood, the older this oocyte is, um, you know, because this oocyte has been, was created during the third trimester of birth, um, the the more likely a non-disjunction event will occur in the production of this ovum. And so these days, you know, when, when you go to prenatal, prenatal appointments, you know, there's certain ultrasounds um, that you would do in order to determine whether or not your, your fetus has a likelihood of having Down syndrome or some, uh, some other disease. And if 
this ultrasound leads to um, uh, leads to there being a high probability, then you actually want to collect cells from the fetus to be able to do this karyotype to determine whether or not this individual has three copies of chromosome 21, for example, if they, if they are a trisomy 21. And so there's two techniques. Um, this is kind of the old school way of doing things that's probably no longer going to be used much. Um, and this is called an amniocentesis. And so this is actually using a very long needle in order to enter the placenta. So you pierce through the uterus, sorry, not the placenta, pierce through the uterus to get into the amniotic fluid. And the amniotic fluid actually contains some fetal cells that have sloughed off um, and can be used for karyotype analysis. And so the way this amniocentesis works is you use an ultrasound to determine where exactly the fetus is within the uterus, and then you make sure that you put you um, use this needle in order to take a sample of amniotic fluid for this. Um, but luckily, uh, a new technique has recently been developed called cetal a cell-free fetal DNA, CFF DNA, and this was by the observation that actually some of the DNA from the fetus is actually transported um, across the placenta into the maternal blood. And so if you simply take a sample of maternal blood, which is you know, a lot easier procedure to do, um, you, know, you, would you, would, you would isolate red blood cells, you'd isolate white blood cells, but pretty remarkably, there's actually free DNA that's floating around the bloodstream. And so this is both maternal DNA, so this is DNA that comes from maybe white blood cells, um, that have lysed, um, but it also contains some of the fetal DNA um, that has transported across the placenta into the mother's bloodstream. And so um, the CFF, this fetal DNA, originate from placental trophoblasts. So these are actually created by the, the fetus um, in the process of development. Um, and they shed these microparticles resulting in the shedding of DNA. And so what is important about this process is that these are very short pieces of DNA, so they're only about 200 base pairs long, uh, but these are actually much smaller than maternal DNA fragment, fragments. So about 11 to 13.4% of cell-free DNA in maternal blood is of fetal origin. Um, and it's present within five to seven weeks after gestation. And so, you know, if you, if you compare the amount of fetal DNA to maternal DNA, you know, it's a very small percent. It's only about 10% of, of the total DNA. But because it's a different size, you can actually use that criteria to separate the fetal DNA from the maternal DNA. And so that means that you can actually do these tests for Down syndrome, for example, you know, very, very early on in the process. Um, and you can actually use these to determine the sex of your baby. So the way we determine the sex of our second kid um, was by doing one of these tests. Um, and so very early on, we determined that our second child was going to be female. All right, so that is the end of chapter two. Um, so that is a very long lecture. Most, don't worry, most of the chapters will not have um, that long of a lecture, uh, but they will have a lot more um, uh, concepts in order to test. Um, so that is it for chapter two.